हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वाचिंग वांटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा Ukraine war is a top headline again. Russia is pounding Ukrainian cities. Multiple missile attacks were reported overnight. Air raid sirens and explosions rent the air. What triggered this new wave of strikes? We'll discuss that tonight. Meanwhile, the West has been embarrassed again. Leaders keep falling for Russian prank calls. Two comedians posing as Zelensky have targeted multiple leaders. The latest on the list is the chief of the US Central Bank. In New Delhi, India did some straight talking with China on the border dispute. Ties cannot be insulated from Chinese expansionism. In China, a panda has inspired a wave of nationalism and anti-US sentiment. It was gifted to the US some 20 years back. It became a national debate and now the panda has been brought back home. And the Church of England is trying to be woke. After saying God is non-gendered, it says being single is okay, even Jesus was single. What do we make of it? Why is the church doing this? We'll tell you about it. The headlines first. Two weeks and counting, fierce fighting rages on in the Sudan. More than 70 people have been killed in just two days in West Darfur, taking the total death toll into hundreds. The fighting continues despite rival forces agreeing to a ceasefire. American election campaigning hits a new low. Republican candidate Nikki Haley says 80-year-old Joe Biden could die within the next five years. Biden is seeking a second term in the 2024 election. BBC chairman Richard Sharp has resigned. An independent report found that he breached rules. He failed to disclose his role in helping former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson secure a loan. Rumours swell around the health of Turkish President Erdogan weeks before his toughest election. He cancelled election appearances for the third straight day. He's 69 years old. Yesterday he appeared virtually to unveil a nuclear plant with Putin. He's been missing in action since falling sick during a TV interview on Tuesday. And is European powerhouse Germany on the brink of recession? Official data shows a stagnant economy in the first quarter. The energy crisis caused by the Ukraine war has badly hit Europe's top economy. We begin with the war. Russia is pounding Ukraine again. For the first time in weeks, air raid sirens blared in Kiev as Russian forces launched a wave of missiles. This is how it ended. Concrete structures reduced to rubble, buildings on fire and panic on the streets. These pictures are from Oman in central Ukraine. An apartment block was struck here. Until this morning, the building was on fire. There were emergency crews at the site. They spent hours looking through the rubble. One part of the apartment block is completely destroyed. Preliminary info is that 109 people lived in that part. 27 out of 46 flats are completely destroyed. We organized operations as fast as possible to rescue the people that are alive and trapped under the rubble. Canine units are also working on the site. These sites were common at the beginning of the war, but towards the end of last year, things eased a bit. Russia stopped these large-scale attacks, presumably because it ran out of missiles. But last night, Russia resumed the missile attacks. Russian forces launched a midnight raid Missiles rained on some of the largest cities in Ukraine. Multiple deaths are being reported, including that of a two-year-old child. These civilians were sleeping when the missiles hit their homes. And Kiev too was rocked by explosions. This is Russia's biggest attack in nearly two months. Less than 24 hours before the attack, the southern city of Mykolaiv was targeted. This is a city in Ukraine and here two civilian buildings were struck. Reports say Russia fired four cruise missiles from the Black Sea. At least one person is said to have died. Now the question is, why has Russia intensified the attacks? Is it trying to send a message to Kiev? A warning perhaps? And I'll tell you why I say this. Ukraine has been planning a counter-offensive. It wants to retake some of its lost territories. Is that why Russia is striking Ukraine? To deter the Ukrainian forces? It's been at it for a while now, in fact. Moscow hasn't spelled out its motives yet, but there's no doubt that it is striking hard. 
and its weapon of choice are missiles. So Russia has been on the offensive and some experts link it to the leaked U.S. intelligence reports. You may remember this, the Discord papers. Dozens of top secret U.S. documents were leaked online. They were dumped on a platform called Discord. And they revealed a vulnerability in Ukraine's defenses. The leaked paper said Ukraine's missile and ammunition stocks could run out by the month of May. Now look at the calendar. We are barely two days away from May. Is Russia trying to exhaust Ukraine's stockpile then? Also, how serious are these shortages? It's hard to make an assessment independently, but earlier this month, another report raised red flags. Ukraine wanted urgent shipments of surface-to-air missiles. It feared that Russia might launch widespread bombing attacks. Now, the Russians are pounding Ukraine in targets, and Kiev has made fresh demands from allies. Zelensky, in fact, issued a statement, and I'm quoting from what he said. Russian evil can be stopped by weapons, and it can, it can be stopped by sanctions. Global sanctions must be enhanced. This is what Zelensky wants. Meanwhile, Ukraine's counteroffensive could begin soon. NATO says it has delivered a vast amount of weapons to Kiev. Overall, through the contact group uh, led by the United States, NATO allies and partners have provided unprecedented support to Ukraine. More than 98% of the combat vehicles promised to Ukraine have already been uh, delivered. That means over 1,550 armored vehicles, 230 tanks and other equipment, including uh, vast amounts of ammunition. This week, Xi Jinping spoke to Zelensky to start some sort of peace dialogue. But with the way the fighting is intensifying, the peace plan may already be in pieces. Meanwhile, the Russians are striking beyond Ukrainian territory. They're targeting Americans too, not with missiles, but with prank calls. And this is no laughing matter. World leaders are falling for it. Former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, singer Elton John, Polish President Andrzej Duda, former German Chancellor Angela Merkel, even Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, they've all fallen prey to Russian pranksters. In the best-case scenario, it's embarrassing. In the worst-case scenario, it's dangerous. The latest victim is this man, Jerome Powell, the chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve. He heads the Central Bank of America. He got a prank call from Russia. The caller pretended to be Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, and he managed to get Powell on the phone. It did not happen today or this week. This call, we are told, was made in January. We are talking about it today because now we have more details and statements. Apparently, it was a video call. Powell picked up the phone and had a full-blown discussion on a range of topics, from the inflation outlook to the Russian central bank. They talked about all of it. And now the video is doing the rounds. Reports say it has been released by the Russian state media. We've not been able to access the video yet, but we do have some quotes. Here is what Powell is believed to have said on the subject of inflation, and I'm quoting. We would tell you that a recession is almost as likely as very slow growth. I think that is partly because of us having raised rates quite a bit, but this is what it takes to get inflation down. That's what Powell told the fake Zelensky. And let me remind you, this isn't some low-level official sitting in a government office. This is the chairman of the U.S. Fed, a man you cannot access easily, but a bunch of Russians got him on a video call and got him to talk about the economy and inflation. Do you know who these people were? Two Russian comedians. Vladimir Krasnov and Alexei Stolyarov, better known as Vovan and Lexis. They call themselves supporters of Putin, and they say they are the ones who pulled off the stunt. Meanwhile, the U.S. Fed has admitted to the blunder. This is what their statement says, and I'm quoting, It was a friendly conversation and took place in a context of our standing in support of the Ukrainian people in this challenging time. No sensitive or confidential information was discussed. The matter has been referred to appropriate law enforcement and out of respect for their efforts, we won't be commenting further. So the Fed says no damage done. And yet this is worrying because it's not a first. In the past, Woven and Lexis have fooled other politicians, the likes of Boris Johnson, not when he was the prime minister, but when he was the UK's foreign secretary. The Russian comedians made a hoax call to him and London blamed the Kremlin for this. Then earlier this year, Christine Lagarde fell prey to something similar. She is the chief of the European Central Bank. The pranksters used the same trick on her. 
They impersonated Zelensky and spoke to Lagarde. I've already told you about the other leaders who fell for this trick. And even though no sensitive information was shared, not that we know of, the very fact that they keep getting pranked should disturb them. These are men and women who run our world. They lead major countries and economies. They flex their militaries at the mere hint of a provocation. They slap sanctions to make rivals bend, but they keep falling for Russian pranks. And you have to feel for Zelensky. How many videos has he made since the war began? Even did a photo shoot for the Vogue, yet his friends in the West cannot tell the fake from the real. All we can say is this, before they plan their next big move, perhaps they should hire a fact checker. Predictability is a cornerstone of foreign policy. Once in a while, you get a nice surprise, but more often than not, it's the same. Case in point, the India-China meeting on Thursday. India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh met his Chinese counterpart, General Li Shang Fu. It was on the sidelines of the SCO Defence Minister's meeting. Symbolically, it was a big deal. The Defence Ministers haven't held talks since the 2020 Galwan clashes. So the picture is made for headlines. But the outcome, not so much. India stuck to the same principles as before. Resolve the border first, then we can normalise. Let me quote the Indian Defence Ministry. This is what they said. Development of relations between India and China is premised on prevalence of peace and tranquility at the border. Violation of existing agreements has eroded the entire basis of bilateral relations and disengagement at the border will logically be followed with de-escalation. And that's a strong message from India. More than strong, it's a clear message. You cannot de-link the border from bilateral relations. Let me explain why. Picture you and your neighbour. One fine day, they extend their compound wall into your property. You stop talking to that neighbour, but they don't seem to care. They want you to forget the encroachment and invite them to your party. Would you agree? I think I know the answer. The fact is, boundaries are key to every relationship, personal, political or bilateral. India says, respect that boundary, then we can talk. What about the Chinese? Well, their statement came much later. The next day, in fact. Let me quote the important bits. The two sides should take a long-term view, place the border issue in an appropriate position in bilateral relations and promote the transition of the border situation to normalised management. So China is of the opposite opinion. They say, let's not focus just on the border. Let's look at the border as part of the larger scheme of things. In other words, put it on the back burner or as Beijing calls it, normalised management. What does that mean? The same words were used by China's former Foreign Minister Wang Yi. It basically means, let's stick to the status quo. How easy for them to say. The normal situation would be pre-2020, before the Galwan clashes. The current situation benefits China and not India, which is why New Delhi is emphasising on resolving the border first. If not, why have international charters and bilateral agreements at all? Every country can keep salami slicing their neighbour. The question is, why are the Chinese so eager to normalise relations now? I say eager because Beijing's statement reeks of it. Let me quote again. China and India share far more common interests than differences. The two sides should jointly contribute wisdom and strength to world and regional peace and stability. How convenient. You encroach your neighbour's border, but you want to create world peace with that same neighbour. What explains this Chinese strategy? Two things. Number one, China sees India as a big market. Despite all the tensions, bilateral trade has boomed. In 2022, it was worth $135 billion. That trade is heavily stacked in China's favour. Their exports to India were worth $118 billion. Their imports from India? Just $17 billion. On average, bilateral trade is growing by 12% every year. Like I said, this is despite all the tensions. The second reason is multilateral engagement. China's ultimate goal is to reshape the global order. First, displace the US, then become the leading global power. But to do that, China needs allies. It needs multilateral organizations to challenge American dominance. And they are BRICS and SCO, to name a few. 
And what's common in both? India. So without New Delhi's support, a new order is not possible. Hence China's eagerness to normalize ties with India. India must realize and leverage this. It's not enough to just say that we are delinking the border and bilateral relations. It must also reflect on the ground. Unfortunately, a hundred billion dollar trade deficit reflects the opposite. My point is, it cannot be business as usual with, with China. It's something India has already done with Pakistan. New Delhi has made it clear that terror and talks cannot go hand in hand. Similarly, border incursions and trade should not go hand in hand. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Just ask Pakistan. It's dialing everyone on the phone book. Old allies, new friends, anybody who can help them out of this crisis. Let's begin with the old ally, the United States of America. Pakistan's ambassador to Washington made an appeal recently. He asked the U.S. to restore military aid and sales to Pakistan. It was stopped by Donald Trump in 2018. Trump accused Pakistan of playing a double game on terrorism. Now, it was an open secret here in India, but I guess it took the Americans decades to realize. Either way, Trump ended military assistance in 2018. But now Pakistan wants it back. The question is, will Joe Biden agree to this? He did approve a military upgrade for Pakistan's F-16 fleet last year. It was a package worth $450 million. But the aid package frozen by Trump is much bigger. Almost $1.3 billion. That's what Islamabad is eyeing. $1.3 billion. Their second SOS call was to their so-called iron brother China. Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif spoke to China's new premier. Two major issues were discussed. One was the economy. China promised support to maintain financial stability in Pakistan. God knows they need it. And second, Chinese assets in Pakistan. Shehbaz Sharif promised to ensure the safety of Chinese workers, institutions and projects. Recently, they've been targeted by terror attacks. Pakistan's army chief is also on the job. General Asim Munir is on a trip to China. It's the first by a Pakistani army chief since the pandemic. He met senior diplomat Wang Yi. The two men reaffirmed the so-called all-weather ties between China and Pakistan. So that's two outreach campaigns by Islamabad, one to America, another to China. They're trying to balance both the big powers, and they're not alone. Countries across the world have been balancing American, America and China. So why is Pakistan different? Because they are beholden to both. Let me explain. China makes up 30% of Pakistan's total debt. Chinese money is keeping the country running. So good relations with China is not a goal. It's a necessity. Same with America. Most Pakistani weapons are of US origin. They need American help to repair and expand their arsenal. And don't forget the IMF help. Without American support, Pakistan can forget that bailout. So Pakistan needs the Americans as well. The question is, will Joe Biden fall for it? In the last century, his predecessors did. Two events made the Americans embrace and cultivate Pakistan. The first was their covert operations in Afghanistan. They used Pakistan as a launching pad. Weapons, money, everything went from Pakistan to Afghanistan. And the second was the US-China normalization. Pakistan was a key broker in those talks. With their help, America opened relations with communist China in the 70s. But that was decades ago. Now the dynamics have changed. For starters, Pakistan is virtually powerless in Afghanistan. In fact, the Taliban have started dictating terms to Islamabad. And secondly, the US has a growing partnership with India. They need India as a bulwark against China. So it's a question of pure strategic importance. Who brings what to the table? Right now, Pakistan brings a whole lot of instability and nuclear weapons. And that's what many experts point to. Pakistan is home to the most dangerous nuclear stockpile. If they fall into the wrong hands, anything could happen. So what does the U.S. do? Keep the relationship alive without investing in it. But going forward, that could become hard. Why? Because Pakistan is growing ever closer to China. Maybe it's out of compulsion, but Washington may not see it that way. Just consider what happened last month. Joe Biden hosted his summit for democracy. More than 100 countries participated. Guess who did not? Pakistan. And they got an invite, but they decided not to attend. I hope America is seeing these moves. A Chinese colony cannot possibly be an ally against Beijing. It's like trying to recruit Canada in the war against U.S. 
simply won't work. America must realize that South Asia's strategic stability is not pinned on Pakistan. In fact, Pakistan is the biggest threat to it. Now let's talk about Pakistan's iron brother China. It's whipping a storm in a teacup. The Chinese are riled up. They're angry with the United States over a panda. That's right. The latest U.S.-China diplomatic row is about a panda. It's called Yaya. In the year 2003, Beijing gave this panda to a zoo in Memphis. Yaya was a goodwill ambassador. She was meant to promote China-US ties. But today she has come to signify the deep mistrust between the two countries. Recently, there was a major outcry on Chinese social media and it got so bad that Yaya had to be dispatched back to China. So why is Beijing being so sensitive about a panda? Let me give you some context. Pandas are central to Chinese diplomacy. Beijing uses them as a tool. It sends pandas to countries around the world. They are sent as gifts, as signs of Chinese friendship. So if China gives you a panda, it means they see you as a special friend. This is China's panda diplomacy. In the early 2000s, China's relationship with the U.S. was rock solid. China had joined the World Trade Organization. America had supported China's membership. The two countries were working together on a host of issues, from the economy to counter-terrorism. They were on the same page on everything, it seemed. It was said that the U.S. administration was full of, quote-unquote, panda huggers. It was the high point of their relationship. So China showed its love. It sent two pandas to the U.S. on a 20-year loan, Yaya and her male companion, Lerler. They ended up in a zoo in Mem Memphis, and they were welcomed with a lot of fanfare. They became the centerpiece of a China exhibit there. That was two decades ago. Remember, the loan was for 20 years. The agreement was about to expire. But a few months back, tragedy struck. Lerler, the male companion of Yaya, died. He died due to a heart disease. And even before his death, stories began circulating on the Chinese internet. Mostly rumors and false claims. They said the Memphis Zoo was mistreating the Chinese pandas. That they were being given substandard bamboo. They said the pandas were malnourished. Then photos began circulating. Some users said Yaya's fur was looking thin and patchy. They complained about mistreatment of the panda at the hands of the Americans. Let me repeat, these were rumors, but they spread like fire. So much so that the fate of Yaya became a national issue in China. To add fuel to the fire, the pandas in America were being compared to those in Russia. Of course, China has gifted pandas to Russia, and Chinese netizens pulled out their photos. They said the Russian pandas looked well, which means Moscow is taking better care of the Chinese animals. Again, none of this had any factual basis, but the narrative caught on. The pandas in America were called oppressed. Soon, online petitions were launched. They demanded the return of Yaya. Look at some of these posters. They went viral. And this is what they said. Mom, I've been working for 20 years. Do I have enough to buy a return ticket home? Here's another one. Protect Yaya, shout it together. The sentiment caught on. And the result is this. Yaya is back in China. Earlier this week, she landed in Shanghai. It was a 16-hour flight. Yaya was brought back on a special Panda Express plane. She's now being kept in quarantine inside a zoo. It is equipped with an air conditioner and an area for outdoor activities. The Chinese government has also issued a statement. It says Yaya was being looked after well in America. The Memphis Zoo has a relatively sound management system and operation procedures. Yaya was under good care throughout her stay in the Memphis Zoo. She is deeply loved by the American people. The cooperative research on giant panda has facilitated the protection of the animal public education and people-to-people -people exchanges. China is willing to continue working with other partners, the U.S. side included, to make contribution to the conservation of endangered species. So all those rumors about mistreatment were at the end of the day just rumors. And the Chinese censors that are famous for scrubbing the internet and controlling the narrative let these rumors spread. The question is, did they start them? Well, there's no way to tell. But Yaya has returned and the row over this panda marks the end of China's panda diplomacy with the U.S. Remember Voldemort from Harry Potter? At first, nobody called him by his name. They were scared and unsure. They called him, you know who, or he who must not be named. 
But towards the end of the books, that changed. They started saying Voldemort's name. People realized you can't hide from your fear. You must confront it. Perhaps Western countries should read that chapter because they can't decide what to call China. Competitor? Rival? Enemy? It depends on who you ask at what time. And this ambiguity applies to their policy as well. They can't decide what to do with China. Decouple, diversify, or as the U.S. is now saying, de-risk. Listen in to the White House National Security Advisor. We are for de-risking and diversifying, not decoupling. We'll keep investing in our own capacities and in secure, resilient supply chains. We'll keep pushing for a level playing field for our workers and companies and defending against abuses. To be clear, it's not a new term. The European Union has previously talked about de-risking. So have businesses in the West. But the question is, what does it mean? How do you de-risk from China? This was Jake Sullivan's explanation. Our export controls will remain narrowly focused on technology that could tilt the military balance. We are simply ensuring that U.S. and allied technology is not used against us. We are not cutting off trade. In case you missed that, the U.S. will not cut off trade with China. Instead, it will focus on strategic technology, things that could have military functions or things that could be used against Western allies. I can give you an example from last year. The U.S. decided to suspend deliveries of F-35 jets. Why? Because the aircraft had Chinese parts inside. Another example could be Huawei. The company has been banned in multiple Western nations. The fear is they snoop for Beijing. These are all examples of de-risking. But why has Washington decided on this policy? And more importantly, what happened to decoupling? The simple answer is money. China-U.S. trade is worth more than $600 billion. This includes a diverse basket of goods like garments made in Xinjiang and precious metals from Tibet. Some of these goods have been sanctioned by the U.S., but not all of them. And from the looks of it, Washington wants to keep it that way. They don't want to decouple from China. They want to pick and choose what to buy and sell. I'm not saying this is the wrong policy. I'm saying it's a confused policy. On one hand, you are engaged in a new Cold War with the Chinese. On the other hand, you're trying to preserve economic ties with them. Can enemies really trade with each other? That question brings us to the point of clarity, or rather the lack of it. Earlier this month, French well, President well, Emmanuel well, Macron visited China. He said Europe simply well, cannot well, be America's well, vassal. Well, he wanted well, to chart a different well, relationship well, with well, Beijing. Well, same with Germany. Chancellor Olaf Scholz is vigorously pushing for a port deal with China. The deal is for one terminal of the Hamburg port. China wants to buy a 25% stake in it. Scholz's own allies are opposed to the deal, but the Chancellor is eager to clear it. At the same time, Germany is looking to curb the export of chip chemicals to China. Do you see the problem here? You're letting China invest in your port, but you're not selling chip chemicals to them. Is this not picking and choosing? Is this not confusion? The fact is, there is a clear political conflict between the West and China. And there is no denying that. But the West wants to insulate their economy from the conflict. Hence, de-risk and not decouple. The problem is, China knows this. They have inserted themselves into key global supply chains, which means two can play at this game. If the West can partially squeeze China, China can return the favor. So what's the way out? Well, Jake Sullivan mentioned that too. Diversification, he said. Taking supply chains out of China and somewhere safe. But to do that, you need to have clarity. All this de-risk talk is nothing but confusion. It's only giving China more time to prepare for any financial assault. Our next story is from Japan. For all its great advancements, Japan has one very regressive feature. It ranks poorly on gender equality, far behind other G7 members, the world's top seven economies. And now Japan is trying to fix this. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida made an announcement yesterday. Let me quote from what he said. We seek to have the ratio of women among executives at 30% or more by 2030 in companies that are listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange's prime market. What does this mean? Will it help fix Japan's problem? Should other countries look at aggressive policy initiatives to achieve gender parity? Also, where does India feature in the global rankings? Our next report has the answers. Japan has a problem. Gender inequality. It's rampant in the island nation. 
And it's quite at odds with Japan's reputation as a developed country. Across the developed world, Japan ranks dead last when it comes to gender equality. Japan ranks 104 out of 190 countries in the World Bank's 2023 Women, Business and the Law Report. In the World Economic Forum's 2022 Global Gender Gap Report, it ranked 116th out of 146 countries. Survey after survey, year after year, have all said the same thing, that Japan's women have it rough. Now, the Japanese government says it's trying to fix things. Yesterday, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida made an announcement. He wants more executive positions at the country's top companies to be occupied by women. Women should make up 30% of the executives at companies that are listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange's prime market. The deadline is 2030. How close is Japan to that target? Not close at all. As of July last year, women accounted for only 11.4% of senior corporate and auditing positions at the companies. Japan Inc. would need to nearly triple their women executives. That too in just seven years. The only silver lining is that the present 11.4% was also reached after a government diktat. Japan had set a 12% women executives target for 2022, so reaching 11.4% isn't too shabby. But Japan is still far behind comparable global standards. Comparable is the operative word. Recently, the EU Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights said Japan's gender gap resembled the situation in Europe 20 or 30 years ago. So Tokyo is still far behind its contemporaries in the developed world. And it's not just business. Let's look at politics. Women occupy only about 10% of the seats in Japan's lower house of parliament. Just 28% of Japan's upper house seats are held by women. And this is after a recent increase in women's representation. To get a clear idea about gender disparity in Japanese politics, you need look no further than Kishida's government. He's clearly not practicing what he's preaching. Only two out of 19 cabinet posts are occupied by women. The most ironic part? Japan's Minister of State for Gender Equality is a man. So if Kishida is serious about fixing Japan's gender imbalance, he could start with his own cabinet. But this problem of gender inequality is rampant across Asia in general. The worst offending region happens to be South Asia. India, for example, ranked 126 out of 190 countries in the World Bank's 2023 Women, Business and the Law Report. And it's one of the better places for women in South Asia. Among its neighbors, India ranks behind only Nepal. The World Economic Forum ranks India at 135th place out of 146 countries. South Asia once again does poorly overall. The WEC says it'll take the region about 200 years to achieve gender parity. And it certainly doesn't help matters to have Afghanistan as a member. Imagine trying to correct the gender imbalance with the Taliban in your team. Jokes aside, patriarchy is not just pervasive, but a tough cookie to crack. So Japan-style mandates may be needed to break the resistance. But even that doesn't always work. The Indian state of Nagaland, for example, has been resisting a government quota on women's representation in politics. Many locals say it goes against tradition. It's an age-old argument, one that's been used in Japan as well. But Japan has finally started to realize that change is needed. Hopefully, South Asia gets there soon too. Because women deserve a seat at the table. And we're not talking about just the ones in your kitchen. Now, if you're among those dealing with pressure to marry, either from family or friends, this story is for you. Because being single is okay, and you have the Church of England to plead your case. And if you think that's bizarre, wait till you hear their reasoning. The Church of England says single people should be valued. Why? Because Jesus was single. Good Lord, we say. Let me explain what they're trying to do here. To make their case, they have published a 238-page long report titled Love Matters. It is a labor of love, pardon the pun, of two years of examining relationships and families. Confession time. I haven't read it. But what it says is basically this, that single people shouldn't be treated as quote-unquote lesser than those in relationships. Not just that, the Church of England, in fact, wants to celebrate singleness. And I'm not making this up because God's own son chose to be a bachelor. So the next time you're accosted at a wedding or engagement of your younger cousin by pesky relatives, you have the perfect repost. You can't be wrong in your life choices if you have Jesus for company. 
Facetiousness aside, why has the Church of England suddenly gone woke? Why is procreation no longer paramount? Why is marriage not the be-all and end-all of every existence? Are they being truly progressive by accepting diversity in personal relations? Not trying to play the devil's advocate, but we don't think so. Why? Because this is the same church that has been eviscerated for being too rigid, tone deaf and out of sync with modern reality. As recently as 2019, the church frowned upon sex outside marriage. It said, and I'm quoting, it falls short of God's purposes for human beings. Now, the recently released report by that same church says, singleness does not necessarily imply celibacy. That's a mighty change of heart for an antiquated institution. But this sudden advocacy of singlehood might be more pragmatic than progressive. Because unlike the biblical Noah's Ark, people want to stay out rather than in the church. So like aging celebrities, the church too is attempting an image makeover to steady the ship as it were. We've talked about the crisis of faith in England, how the number of faithfuls has been dwindling. The confidence in the church is extremely brittle, especially among the young. So, and the church knows this. It has to rebrand itself to stay relevant. Ironically, the first casualty of this happened to be God himself. And to refer to him as he might no longer be acceptable because the Church of England is considering the use of gender neutral terms for God. Many have slammed the decision. They say it's taking things too far. They're, they're accusing the church of losing its way in the quagmire of political correctness. So we ask, is the church overcompensating to fix its reputational damage? Almost like it has boxes to tick to maintain its aura of credibility. Admittedly, the church report does reflect the reality of present-day Britain. The number of single people has shot up, more than 8% jump from 2011 to 2021. And the report talks not just about single people, but also those from the LGBTQ community and their alienation from the church. Earlier this year, it agreed to bless same-sex couples who had civil marriages. But it still refuses to allow same-sex marriages to be held in the church. That's the hill or should we say the cross, that they have chosen to die on. So while the church seems determined to shed its cloak of conservatism, the question is, will it mitigate the crisis of faith in Britain? Well, only God knows. But what we can say for certain is this. The war cry of singles this season is Miley Cyrus's breakup song, Flowers. Even Beyonce celebrated the single life with a hit song, Single Ladies, and now the Church of England agrees being single has never looked this good. Our last story tonight is about a statue. A statue of the Buddha has been found in Egypt. It dates back to the age of the Roman Empire. Egypt has also unearthed a Sanskrit inscription and coins belonging to an Indian kingdom. So how did these artifacts land in Egypt? Well, it's more proof of what we've long known. India's global footprint is a centuries-old story. India has been interacting with the world for millennia. It spans trade, cultural exchanges, and even the spread of Indic religions. India has left a mark across the world, which is why symbols of ancient civilization keep emerging around the world. This time, it happens to be Egypt. Our next report tells you more. India and Egypt are both among the oldest civilizations of the world. And they have a history of close contact from ancient times. So it's no surprise that this statue of the Buddha has been found in Egypt. The statue was found in the ancient Egyptian town of Berenike. According to a statement by Egypt's Antiquities Ministry, a Polish-US mission discovered the statue. The mission was digging at an ancient temple in the seaport town. It said the discovery has important indications over the presence of trade ties between Egypt and India during the Roman era. The statue measures 28 inches in height and part of its right side, including the leg, are missing. The Buddha is portrayed with a halo around his head and also a lotus flower by his side. It's not known how exactly the statue landed in Egypt. But if we were taking a guess, the statue got there during the reign of Emperor Ashoka. Ashoka's edicts refer to his relations with Egypt, particularly when Egypt was under the rule of Ptolemy II some 2,300 years ago. It's not just the Buddha's statue that's been found. 
archaeologists also stumbled across a Sanskrit inscription, believed to be about 2,000 years old. Apart from the statue and inscription, two second-century coins from the Satavahana Kingdom of India were also found. The port of Berenike was among the main trading hubs of Egypt. It handled ships carrying a variety of products from India. Products like pepper, spices, precious stones, textiles and even ivory. These goods would be transported on camelbacks across the desert to the Nile River. From there, they eventually found their way to the rest of the Roman Empire. The city of Berenike was itself one of the transit hubs which connected the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean. Needless to say, trade between India and Egypt was booming, and remnants of ancient ties between both the civilizations are now being unearthed. In 2021, Egyptian torpedo jars were unearthed in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Archaeologists believe that the jars were used to transport oil from Egypt to India. And while some Indian artifacts landed in different parts of the world due to trade, others were snatched by force as a result of foreign conquests. According to India's Ministry of Culture, over 200 stolen artifacts have been retrieved since 2014. Most of these came from the UK, Canada, Australia, the US and France. Again, there's a reason why so much was stolen from India. Up to the 17th century, India was one of the world's largest economies that made it a target for innumerable invasions and colonial conquests. The discovery of Indian artifacts in Egypt is not a fluke. Egypt has been on a mission lately to revive its tourism industry. And in that endeavor, it has unveiled many archaeological discoveries in recent years. Critics say the Egyptian government is conducting a flurry of excavations. The goal is to find items that grab the media's attention. Egypt plans to attract over 30 million tourists annually by 2028. This would be a significant jump. Before the pandemic, Egypt attracted just 13 million people. Be that as it may, Egypt's quest to unearth artifacts has now shown the kind of relationship it shared with India thousands of years ago. And before we end the show with Vantage Shots, here's something we'd like to share with you. When we hit 1 million subscribers on YouTube, we promised you new shows and we're ready with one. Starting tomorrow, we're bringing you a new weekly show. It's called Flashback. As the name suggests, it's about history, but not the boring kind you learn in school. This history is presented in a fun and interesting way. You can catch all the big world events, the people who shaped them and the lessons we should learn from them. Stay tuned to First Post Flashback. Our first episode airs tomorrow. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with the Pope. Pope Francis is in Hungary for a three-day visit. This is his first trip since he was admitted to hospital in March. Spain, meanwhile, has put an end to the, tra to the tradition of dwarf bullfighting, a move that has been lauded by disability groups. In Kenya, citizens are planting their age in trees, an active effort to combat deforestation in the country. And finally, what makes April the 28th significant? We're taking you back in history. On this day in 1945, Italian dictator Benito Mussolini was executed. He was shot dead by Italian partisans. This happened while he and his mistress were trying to flee to Switzerland. Mussolini was then hung upside down in Milan's public square. A gruesome death for the dictator who once founded fascism. We leave you on that note. Thanks for watching.
from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colony. and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the colonial loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting. becoming a UK PM. Well, it's not like that we are going to get the Kohinu back. <laughs> <laughs> but at least India is on its way to the top. Huh? But Gautam sir, there's actually not much to celebrate. Why not? An Indian is ruling the UK. Indian leaders in third countries often tend to overcompensate for their minority handicap. Key. For example, Sunak's Home Secretary of Indian origin, Suela Brahman, disapproved of India-UK free trade because it would encourage people immigrating to the UK and the majority of whom were Indians. Structurally, India and UK have passed baggage, but still hasn't been resolved. And that is why... Ladies and gentlemen, India needs to significantly temper its expectations from Rishi Sunak. Presenting Vantage with me, Palki Sharma, a first-of-its-kind global show with an Indian perspective.